Hey everybody, this is Corey from Dirty Honey, and this is Alive and Loud. Welcome to Alive and Loud, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today we are doing a part one of our drummer series, and today we have a special guest. It is Corey from Dirty Honey. Thanks for joining us today, man. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. So you guys just started touring uh, here recently, and I got to say that's probably been the highlight of your year so far, right? I mean, yeah, definitely. Black Crows, Dirty Honey, big tour. A, that's a pretty big deal. That's a big lineup. Yeah. It's been like, I was saying, like I was saying before, the last time I seen you play was St. Louis at the pageant with uh, Skillet and Alter Bridge. And that was one of my absolute favorite shows that I caught in the last probably five years. Um, you guys were on fire that night. Uh, what I loved about you guys is that you guys are just so down to earth. And, you know, that's, I feel like that's, that's a lost art on a lot of artists these days is going to the merch booth and hanging out and talking to fans and slinging your own merch and like really just doing the work. And, you know, that was one of the things that really gravitated me towards you guys. And I was like, you know what? I think these guys are going to be around for a good while. And, yep. you know, it, it was uh, not long after that we saw many more tour announcements that you guys were hopping on. So I, I was glad to stand uh, corrected there that you guys were onto something big. So that's great. Uh, how have you been doing? What have you been up to? Uh, we've just been getting underway with this tour with the Black Crows. I think we've done four shows at this point um so yeah we're just kind of getting used to the routine and the schedule and where everybody needs to be when everybody needs to be and how it's all working and getting comfortable and but it's been great yeah that's awesome like i said i narrowly miss you guys in nashville and i'm i'm really like i'm upset but i'm not upset as you know we just had a, another baby so right. we're uh we're we're happy that she's here but super bummed that we missed you so hopefully as long as you're within five hours, I'm game to drive. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, we'll make it happen. Well, you'll make but, it happen. Yeah, I'll make it happen, man. Uh, so I, I want to get started with uh, this drummer series. Uh, a lot of people just go and they see a band and they're like, oh, this is one of my favorite bands. And they just, you know, kind of view it as a whole experience and they never really break it down uh, piece by piece. So what I want to do with this is I'd like for you to talk to us a little bit about like what were your influences as a drummer growing up and getting into your craft? Yeah, first starting out, um, it was definitely the drummers of the music that my parents listened to. So that would have been Van Halen on my dad's side. So Alex Van Halen, naturally, and Joey Kramer, Aerosmith. My mom was a huge Aerosmith fan. Um, and so th I would say those two guys and then Neil Peart, Rush was another, th those kind of three and were, were the the primary influences, I guess, when I was first starting out. And then later kind of started discovering more drummers in that classic rock genre, I guess. Right. Um, yeah, Keith Moon, Bonham, Mitch Mitchell, Don Henley. Uh, Don Henley's great. Yeah, there's a, I just discovered a, a live Eagles from Houston, I think, mm -hmm. uh, record from 76, I think. And they do a cover of Funk 49 on there. And it's like, it's a little different than, than the original with the feel and the tempo and everything, but it's like, it's so nasty. So good. Oh, yeah. what if, he's a very criminally underrated drummer. Not a lot of people talk about him as, as one of their influences. So that's really cool to hear. Um, yeah. So you also kind of played around in some jazz music, am I right? You were right, uh, although I would not call myself a jazz drummer because that's, right. uh, in my mind, a big guys who I look up to that are jazz drummers. It's like that's all they do, and they it's it's a whole lifelong pursuit. Uh, I think becoming a great jazz drummer, specifically or especially. Um, but yeah, I, d I definitely like once I started kind of taking drumming a little bit more seriously and wanted to try to make a career out of it. Um, I think in every drummer's path, or most drummers maybe, or hopefully at some point you kind of dive into other genres of music and um, study that stuff and those players. And obviously in jazz, there's, that's like, like I said, a lifelong pursuit in its own. So I definitely um, 
yeah, it was introduced by uh, some teachers to a lot of the great jazz drummers from the 60s and 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and I definitely still pull a lot from those guys playing. Yeah, do you, so do you feel like uh, kind of touching bass in different genres uh, of drumming kind of helped you create your play style for Dirty Honey? Uh, I think so. Half the time I second guess myself on stage of <laughs> if I'm playing appropriately or not. I'm trying to do uh, this balancing act of just holding it down in my mind how uh, maybe Joey Kramer would play a rock show with Aerosmith and throw in some kind of, um, I don't know, Mitch Mitchell, jazzy-esque uh, fills and, and just tasty little nuggets here and there. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Listening to California Dreamin', you know, that was one of the, the songs that really took me by surprise is because you you start that song off quite heavy and thunderous on the kit. And that's, yeah. that's something that I really lo love to listen to whenever I listen to a song is like, who's going to lead off the song? Is it going to be the bass line? Is it going to be, you know, guitar? Is it going to be rhythm? Yeah. Uh, and few songs really get my attention whenever it opens up with the drum part. Um, there's a Nickelback song uh, off of All the Right Reasons that starts off with a uh, really killer drum fill. And uh, so this one, I was like, oh, shit, you know, this he's already in, he's already grooving in the pocket right here. So uh, with that one in specific, if, if you could tell us a little bit about what that was like, you know, creating and cultivating that uh, particular song with you on the drums. Um yeah i mean as far as i'm aware that was the last song uh or as far as i can remember at least that was the last song that actually came together in the studio when we were tracking it and so i think i was probably least or fairly unfamiliar with it even when we were recording it we'd obviously rehearsed it and stuff and ran through it but it takes time to kind of develop uh like for example if i'm playing when i'm gone or rolling sevens now we've played it so many times that I've kind of figured out ways that I like to fill in the gaps or not, and um, and just how to play the song like in a more detailed, refined way, as opposed to not being super familiar with the tune, like California Dream. And we get in the studio, I kind of have to like paint with broad strokes, so to speak, with the drum part. Um, but yeah, I don't know. My goal. I mean, one of the things was getting comfortable with a new kit. So I played a four piece kit um, on the first record and on those first tours that we did. Uh, and now I'm playing a six piece. So I've added two toms um, and a couple of cymbals to the kit. So trying to <laughs> find my way around that, a new instrument essentially, and um, yeah. um, throw in some new, I mean, I'm always practicing and working things out. And so trying to find way, tasteful ways is always my objective. I don't know if I ever achieve that, but I try um, to throw in some cool things. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you find yourself enjoying the challenge of like increasing your, your kit like that with going from four to six and adding a few more cymbals? I know a lot of drummers tend to like fluctuate you know per tour whether they're adding or removing certain drums or or mm -hmm. more you know sometimes more is less sometimes less is more what are you finding that to be something that you're enjoying i yeah i enjoy experimenting with different drums and sounds and configurations and things and um i was actually just considering though reducing it back to a four piece because i feel like this thing, I'm sure a lot of drummers can relate to, the more drums you have to hit, the more you always feel like you have to, every fill ends up going all the way around the toms, for example, or like, as opposed to if you have no toms, then you're forced to, I don't know, maybe choose something that's more of a rhythmic statement and, um, and playing it on one instrument. And I think that ends up being pretty much 100% of the time, the most musical choice. And the thing that um, if I'm listening to a drummer do that, or if I listen back to myself or something, it's like that, the less instrument 
thing, the more simplistic instrumentally thing, but the more musical, maybe you're forced to, to use dynamics. Um, maybe you're forced to use accents or, or a different rhythm um, as opposed to just playing the same rhythm, the same dynamics, and then going all the way down the kit. So then you're relying on melody essentially. It's, I don't know, it's, there's different ways to look at it, but yeah, I enjoy all of that. And sometimes I get very frustrated with all that. <laughs> yeah, and one thing I love about watching you play that I've noticed the last couple of times I've seen you is you seem to really enjoy playing this music. And I know that sounds kind of silly to say out loud, but if you really pull it back a little bit and just analyze watching people play their instruments on stage, you know, some people, tour life can be very androgynous, can be very hard. Uh, some people are entitled to have bad days, you know, sometimes things just don't go the way that they're planning. Uh, and it reflects in their stage presence. But every time I've seen you play, you seem to be really enjoying yourself. And that's something as a consumer of live music and someone who's doing photography for a living, I love to see that. So do you feel, is is being behind the kit, is that something that you just knew right away that you were born to do? Or is that something that came later to you? Um, it's kind of been the focal point of my whole life and career choices and everything. So I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's just been the only thing that I've ever really put any focus towards <laughs> for better or worse. Um, but yeah, a lot of times when we're playing and up on stage and things are gelling and the crowd's into it and everything's just kind of aligning, I definitely have moments where I think to myself, like, this is very cool. and. I can't really imagine myself doing anything else. Yeah, so. that's awesome. So, you know, shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about thrones because every drummer knows that if you're going to be sitting there, whether it's a 30 minute set or if it's an hour and a half set or, you know, you're headlining a festival and you're playing for two and a half hours, you want to be comfortable because you're sitting there for a good while unless you're Lars Ulrich and you're standing and playing half the time. Uh, so tell us, what is one of your favorite thrones to sit on and why? Like, could you tell us about why that's also important for you? Favorite throne? I've never been asked this question, so props. Uh, <laughs> I do not have a fancy throne. I have a very uh, low budget, minimally padded, uh, minimally stabilized uh, DW throne. Um, and it's been fine. It's it's just been kind of the workhorse. What I don't like is the the hydraulic thrones. The oh of, yeah, they're nice to adjust. They like if you feel like you want to just quickly adjust something, that they, they do that. But um, I actually don't really like how they kind of like bounce when you yeah play. So that would be like, my one. So you like to kind of get back in the same spot you were already at previously. If you have to sit up for just a second. Yeah, I, I just like a, a real stable throne is what I prefer. So why is that so important to you and in, in, in your playing specifically? A stable throne? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I play heel up. So I play on the balls of my feet and maybe a, uh, a bouncy throne. If it's hydraulic, maybe gets in the way of some of that it's, it's there's no anchor point for me to like sit my butt on and be supported for yeah. me to play with my heels up maybe i know for me whenever i drive to a show and i know it's probably completely unrelated but whenever i'm driving like the two to five hour distances i have to pull over at some point and get off my ass because it's it's super uncomfortable to sit for so long so i can't imagine when you're actually working and playing on the kit you're going to have to kind of sit up just a second just to kind of get your bearings right. So, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. if we're only playing for like an hour or 55 minutes, like we're doing with the crows now, it's not too bad for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, when we were just out doing our own headlining thing, um, you know, John takes a guitar. So that's a good moment for me to get up and stretch. Um, the other thing that's maybe related to <laughs> drum thrones is posture. I have absolutely horrific posture when I'm playing. And so that's something that I'm trying to work on and sitting up straighter and not. Now, 
Now to kind of segue into that, because I've, I've been doing my research and you actually do yoga, right? I was like three years ago and then three years back. So I had a three year period three years ago that I was very much into yoga and, and it, that yoga was actually for a, a brief, well, a three year period, um, the focal point of what I was doing. So I was doing like two or three classes a day. I was taking it very yeah. seriously. And, Do you feel like it helped with your posture and and things like that? Definitely. During that time when I was doing it that much, yeah, I would sit down, even walking through a grocery store, whatever. It's like you're standing up straight or your shoulders are back and down. Um, But since I just, I kind of fell out of the loop with it a bit and haven't Mm. been practicing. I still practice here and there just to like stay somewhat limber. But I was going to say, do you do any like pre uh, pre show stretching or anything like that to get ready? Yeah, I try to um, I try to just warm up. So I have a practice kit. It's like a practice pad set um, that I tote around with me, and it drives everybody insane because it's an extra bag to pack in the van, and it's heavy. Yeah. But and if I can't find a place to practice, then they can usually hear me um, around the corner or in the dressing room, or whatever. And, um, but yeah, that's probably the first thing I do is set up my practice kit and try to just get my limbs and things moving and a little bit warmed up. Um, and I find that if I don't warm up and I get out on stage and I'm overly excited or something, I'm not paying attention to uh, conserving energy throughout the show. And if I just go out guns blazing, I'll mm-hmm. get really bad forearm plump. But what oh, I found, man. what I found is that if I can, um, if I can kind of like push myself to that forearm pump place on mm. the practice kit before we go out, then it kind of gets it out of the way. And then I can go out there a little more guns blazing and not have to worry so much about um, fatigue right off the bat. Yeah. Aside from that, I mean, I just do, yeah, I kept like wide legged forward fold stretch, stretch my, you know, basic, basic stretches and stuff. Um, to loosen up nice well I know you know like I said before uh when you step behind the kit I've, I've never seen you put on a bat show I'm sure that you know as a drummer you're you're thinking well I've had bat shows because everyone is you know very critical of themselves and that's the good thing about being in this community is we don't want to be complacent and think that well I just played my best show I can never get better than that you know we always want to improve but I do have to say like you know every time I've watched Dirty Honey play on stage and if any of you that are watching or listening have seen Dirty Honey, you know that Corey is just in his zone every single time that he's playing. So stretching is is a key thing. You know, if if you're an up and coming drummer, make sure you're doing some stretches because you don't want to get up there and and lock up and and have those sort of things happen to you live on stage, whether it's for 10 people or 10,000 people. Um, Corey, I want to ask, man. So if you're going to break down your kit, what is what is the kit that you're rocking on right now? What are what are you do what are you using? Yeah, currently it's a DW uh, Maple Jazz series. So I think those shells are kind of uh, crafted or, or shaped towards the '70s Gretsch vibes yeah. so of a gumwood something in there. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah, and they're it's just a black lacquer finish. Um, so 10 by 7, 12 by 8, 14 by 12, 16 by 14 toms. Kick is a 22 by 16. Um, at some point, I want to step it up to a 24. Uh, but for now, it's a 22. And the snare is a 14 by 7. Beefy boy. Oh, yeah. And what kind of symbols are you? Are you, uh, are you a Zildjian man? Right. Yeah. Um, I don't have uh, like an, an official deal or anything with uh, Zildjian, but yeah, Zildjian's pretty much always been. Um, well, if they're watching right now, maybe that can change. You never know. Give, give yeah, this man we'll an endorsement. See. We'll see. Um, I won't say no, Zildjian. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I use uh, pretty much all Zildjians. Well, actually, all Zildjians. Um, and that's just a mixture of stuff. That's I'm switching out symbols a lot uh, from show to show, trying to figure out. It's hard to find um, 
I don't know, it's hard to find a good a, a match set where For sure, like, yeah. like the crashes to all have a, a um, harmonious uh, pitch association, I guess, with, with them one another. Mm -hmm. um, the ride, anyways, the ride I'm using is a 23 inch uh, K prototype. So it's pretty beefy, pretty heavy, um, but still kind of dark. And then I've got usually just two 20 inch crashes. Um, Right now, it's one's an A custom crash, another one's a, a custom ride. That's my second crash. Every once in a while, I'll throw up on the left side a 22 inch Constantinople fin ride. Uh, and that kind of spawned from one of the things I like to try to practice here and there is um, playing whatever groove I might play normally and then um, whatever down the road for example or something but lead with my left hand and try to do try to make it feel good but switching roles with my hands basically so I put a ride up uh, from time to time to try to exercise that and challenge mm -hmm. myself also it's a nice texture to have a, a, a really dark kind of jazzy ride symbol as opposed to uh, my main ride it's a little bit more harsh i guess i was gonna say it, feel, it probably feels kind of nice to change it up a bit on that yeah it's a it's a it's back to that balancing act thing it's interesting because it's like i do hear in my head from time to time more drums in a certain fills in certain spots mm -hmm. uh, or more symbol um you know i want to have bright symbols and dark symbols and stuff so i have the option because i hear those things um and when i'm reduced to a small kit it's like oh, i wish i had the extra floor tom or or the trashier crash or something but it's a kind of a catch-22 because it's like okay well yeah you might be able to get play a bigger kit and have those uh voices in your arsenal more readily available yeah. but what you're compromising maybe and this is what i'm trying to figure this out with my playing stuff is um you might be compromising musicality in a way like maybe you wouldn't have that different crash sound or the bigger floor tom to end the fill on but without that like i said then it forces you to use dynamics and that's always a good thing or more syncopation or right uh, things like that and the hi-hats i'm using to put round out the symbol thing is um um I just picked up actually a pair of seventies new beats that are working out pretty nice. Okay. So still Zildjian vintage. I also have a fifties Avitas 20 inch ride, uh, that I throw up sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's a hell of a damn kit right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know you guys are out with black crows right now, which has got to be pretty amazing for you. You know, everybody's listening to them growing up um what are some other artists that you'd really like to get in in a tour with um i don't know i mean for me personally like i said you know growing up with aerosmith and van halen i mean van halen i guess isn't gonna happen now unfortunately because of eddie's passing which i'm still uh not ready to accept <laughs> Once yeah, later. it's pretty hard to accept that one, man. That one, that one hit close. It doesn't seem real, right? It's like oh. he can't be gone. What? Is that? But I, I, it's really awesome to kind of to see what uh, what Wolf is doing, you know, to carry on his dad's legacy. It's right a tremendous thing. I'm actually going to go cover them in Louisville. Um, right. so that's going to be it's going to be awesome because I enjoy his music, but it's also going to be like a really almost emotional time, you know, in the photo pit because of the circumstances. So yeah. We're it's um, unreal. Yeah, we're doing a show with him uh, late September, I think. So. Oh, cool. Where uh, we're at? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> it's on the website somewhere. I don't know. I'll, stop I'll put the date. I'll put the dates in the description. I'll find them. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I don't know. So Aerosmith, Van Halen. I mean, opening for the Who when we did that couple years ago was amazing and that was very surreal i mean the black crows is amazing too it's yeah 
It's a pinch me moment for all of it. Yeah, very, very cool. So they're, they're a great band too. Um, I was watching them. I think we played, did we play last night? We played last night and, um, or no, we didn't play last night, two nights ago. I was watching them from up on the side stage thing. And yeah, they are, um, they are very good. Well, it's awesome to see you, man. Uh, I want to ask if you, if you could give any drummer uh, that's currently playing or anybody who's thinking about picking up a pair of drumsticks uh, and getting into it, what would you give them for advice? I mean, to not get too heady and too into it, I would just say have fun. Just do what you enjoy. How's that? Pretty sound advice for me. I know I have absolutely no rhythm other than tapping on the, the old steering wheel there, you know. Uh, that's about as much drumming as I do. I, I don't even try to attempt the air guitar, so I'll just <laughs> stick to tapping on the steering wheel as I drive, listening to Rolling Sevens. But uh, Corey, it's been awesome to talk to you, man. Uh, I look forward to everything that you got coming up. Uh, like I said, hopefully we'll link up on the road here soon. Um, for those of you that are watching and listening right now, whether you're in your car or you're at home or in your office, you're watching us on YouTube, uh, make sure you follow Dirty Honey. Make sure you keep up with Corey. Uh, very great drum, you know, drummer here. And uh, I, I'm excited to see what all is coming up for the band next. Me too. We'll see. All right. We'll well, guys, thanks so much for tuning into Alive and Loud Drummer Series Part 1. Corey, thanks for being our, our first guest. We, uh, we really appreciate it. The door is always open whenever you want to come back and hang out. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Good to see you. Appreciate you. Good to see you, man.